the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. If you came with your Bibles, Second Kings chapter seven and verse three. Second Kings chapter seven and verse three. Second Kings chapter seven and verse three. On the matters of destiny, this is the first scripture I want to share with you. When we come tomorrow night, we'll pray again for one hour. I'll share another scripture with you. We'll keep doing that till we get till Sunday. Part of what the Lord said to me, I like repeating it because when you write the vision, when you make it plain, them that see it, them that read it, can do what? Run with it. So that's why God, when he has something to do amongst his people, he leads his prophet to prophesy. The prophecy is to give the people a word picture of what it is that God has in his heart to accomplish. So you can now use that prophecy as a tool to lay a demand on the character of God to do that which it is that he has spoken that he will do. So this is why you will see that when men who found their own prophecy, when they wanted to die, they were bold enough, bold, to say that they have finished. Why were they able to say they, were, they had finished? Because they knew when they started. They knew exactly how far they were required to run. Paul knew that even as anointed as he was, he was not sent to everybody. He knew as anointed as he was, he was not called to do everything. He said, just as the ministry of the Jews was given to, the, to Peter, the ministry to the Gentiles have been committed unto me. When you see him introducing himself, he will say, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was not mincing words. He was not calling himself an apostle because somebody prophesied to him. He was calling himself an apostle because he knew the ordination that was on his head. So when he was about to die, he was telling Timothy, he said, like a drink offering, I'm ready to be poured out. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And now there is laid up for me a crown. Paul was very sure that based on the way he had lived his life, his reward was guaranteed. Paul was not thinking, he was not thinking, say, maybe there's something in my life that will make God say, <laughs> he was 100% sure. You know why? He had seen the script. He knew what was written. He knew what was spoken and he knew he had fulfilled it. Look at Jesus. Jesus was upon the cross. Darkness had covered the whole earth and he lifted up his face to the heavens unto his father. And then the Bible says, by the time he was bending his head, he had concluded with his father that this assignment is finished. So he bent his head, lifted up his voice, he cried, it is finished. It is when he said it is finished, the Bible says he gave up in the ghost. So as long as it was not finished, he was not permitted to die. He confirmed, he confirmed that this work, notice he did not say I am finished. It, indicative of the fact that it was the assignment he was speaking about. This thing, that my father sent me to do on the earth, it is finished. 
Look at John the Baptist. I've heard them use John the Baptist to teach all kinds of strange things. Well, you can make the Bible say all kinds of things. Say John the Baptist was so weak that a woman was able to demand for his head. Meanwhile, the one who they demanded for his head, eh? the one whom they demanded for his head, he said, I must decrease so that he will increase. If you are decreasing, the only way down is the grave. If you are being removed from the scene completely so that another man can shine, the end of your descent is where? The grave. So when they took his head, it was not something to be ashamed about. His own assignment had what? Finished. John died at probably 31 or 32 years old. But when Jesus spoke about him, <laughs> he said of man born of a woman, there has not risen a prophet as great as John the Baptist. How long did he live? He was 32. Some of you here are more than 32. More than 32. Some of you are approaching, approaching 30 already. If John only lived for 32 years, and when we die, generations will still be talking about him. When we get to heaven, he will be one of those that heaven will continue to celebrate. Didn't work one miracle, did not raise one dead, did not cast out one devil. All he did was to find what it was that he was sent to do and do it. You will not, you, 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 you will have so much time on your hand to do foolish things and useless things because you have not found the main thing you are supposed to be doing with your life. Men who don't know destiny are aimless. They are hapless, hopeless. They waste their resources. The resources of their lives, the resources of their time, resources of their body, resources of their money is going in the wrong direction. You hear that everybody is doing safety. Say now safety, they say now. Then you go and do safety. Say no, no, no. It's not safety. Then you struggle. You save money. You save money. You do project management. Now it is AI. It's AI. It's AI. It's coding. It's data analytics. Everybody's. What, what, how come you cannot put your ear to the breast of God? And hear what it is that God is telling you. I remember Monday. Monday can tell you his story by himself. He's not ashamed to say it. When I met him, he came to Escravos as a helper. Helper. But from the day he landed in Escravos, he knew that that place was just a gate. He began to learn how to do pipe fitting. He began to learn how to weld. He knew that that place was a springboard in destiny. But many of us are stuck in cycles, stuck in circles. We don't know where we are going. A girl is speaking in tongues. She's just waiting for a man to come and marry her. Okay, when he marries, marries you and you are in his house and you have had children and you can cook and your children are dressing well, what next? What is the end of your existence? So it's while I was praying, praying for my own company, RC and Worry, and saying, God, please, this year, see what you have told us. Please leave nobody behind. He gave me this scripture. And he began to explain to me. You remember this scripture in 2 Kings chapter 7? We don't have the time, but you can go and read it. Read 2 Kings chapter 6. Read 2 Kings chapter 7. You will see the story. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the king was walking about a siege had been, has, had been put against Samaria. A serious siege in 2 Kings chapter 6. And on the basis of that siege, a woman and her friend made an agreement that they were going to eat their children. So they agreed to eat this person's child today and eat this other person's child the next day. So the way we were able to come into the knowledge of that agreement and that contract is that as the king was walking past, the Bible says he was walking on the wall. As he was walking past, the woman cried out to him and said, help us, O king. And the king says, from whence can I help you? 
Is it from the wine press or from the threshing floor? What he was simply saying is that there is no food in the wine press. There is no food in the threshing floor. I have nowhere to help you. All of us are suffering. After a while, he looked at her and said, okay, what is the matter? She now told him this story. It's on the basis of this story that the Lord now put his word in the mouth of his servant. Meanwhile, the one who was to prophesy, the king was so angry that day, after he heard what had happened, he sent messengers to go and kill the prophet. After he heard that my people have begun to eat their own children, he said, the one causing this problem is Elijah. He said, go and kill him. Meanwhile, the one who they, they sent to kill, he was sitting in his house, and he told the elders of Israel that were sitting with him, he said, look, that, that evil man, he has sent a man to come and kill me. He said, but block him at the door. So some of the elders ran to the door to block the messenger. As they were blocking the messenger, the anointing on his head stayed. And then he prophesied. He said, by this time tomorrow. <laughs> by this time tomorrow. A cruise of oil. And what is the other one now? A barley of wheat shall be sold for so and so on the streets of Samaria. So notice the progression. The first thing that came forth was a prophetic word. On the basis of this prophetic word, the Bible now says, there were four lepers who sat at the gate. These four lepers, because of their condition, they were ostracized. They could not go into the city. If they went into the city, they would be driven because they were contaminated. They could not mingle with fellow Israelites. So they were at the gate. But because of where they were on the journey of destiny, they became desperate to shift their condition. So in 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 3, they began to say, Why sit we here until we die? You see, no matter the prophecy that has been given, if you are not desperate for destiny, you will never enter it. It was the desperation of four men. Four men. They are desperate. They say, why is it? Why, why should our story be that we sat at the gate and then we died? We can't enter the city. If we go into the city, they will drive us. We will die of hunger. Say so it's best. Rather than sit here and die, let's begin to take steps forward. Adventure. If we get to the camp of the Syrians, they will spare us alive, take us as slaves, and at least we'll have to eat. But we will not sit here and die. Many of you, the reason it looks as if every time you pray, God doesn't want to say anything to you. God knows that you are not desperate for what you are seeking. In the depths of your heart, you are comfortable with your current identity. You have not become desperate for what is written concerning you. Is this the best version of your life? Is this, this, this thing you are living now, is this the best version of your life? Is it? If it is not, I want you to become angry in these 40 days. To say, Lord, what exactly do you want to do with my life? You'll be thinking now that your problem is money. As one who, by grace and mercy, I have climbed the ladder from the bottom, I can tell you that the more money you get, the more you realize that money cannot answer all the questions in your heart. I can tell you for free. It can't. You are thinking now that the problem is that you are not seeing enough food to eat. I assure you, I have learned by experience that God does not waste resources. God will always send his resources where his purpose is known. The minute he sees that you have begun to live in a consciousness 
of your kingdom mandate, you begin to push resources to you. Resources. Men are resources. Men. You'll just be walking inside, inside one place. Just be walking inside one place. Then somebody will just meet you. Let me just give you a, a very, very funny example. For instance, in this, in this city, if I don't want to be buying bread again, there is somebody who is willing to be giving me bread every day. Bread. So for instance, that scripture in Matthew, when he says, the birds of the air, they neither spin nor store in bands, but your heavenly father takes care of them. That's how God can be sending me bread every day and I don't have to pay one naira. In fact, when I'm passing where the brother sells bread, I used to dodge. But the minute he sees me, he will package one, put in your nylon and say, bless you, my pastor. Bread. God will always send resources. You think your biggest problem now is lack. God can supply your needs without you moving a finger. But if he brings you to that place and you don't know destiny, you will waste resources. You will become useless to yourself, useless to the kingdom. You will not know what to do with your time. Not know what to do with your life. So whenever a prophecy goes forth, people enter into the reality of it by desperation. God, you said you created everything for a purpose. Even the wicked for the day of trouble. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs. Everything he has created for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. That means even me. God created me for a purpose. Have you found why you were created? Have you found it? Have you found it? That's why this one week, God said, dedicate it to intercession. Pray. Pray. Let my eyes open. Let me see what I look like in the spirit. Let me know the things that have been written concerning me. You don't know how easy it is to be yourself. Somebody like me now, I am not competing with any preacher in the world. God forbid it. I'm not trying to be like any other preacher in the world. I know my message. I know my message. I know what he has called me to do. And I do it without apologies. Without apologies. Sometimes when I, I sit down and I want to be like, Lord, this thing is too difficult for me. Why did you choose me? Then it is that period you just lead somebody to call me. I saw somebody make a comment on one of our videos. As old as I am, I didn't know such a country existed. I know you don't even know the country. The person was following our meeting and said, I am following from Suriname. Do you know a country called Suriname? Go and check. It's a small island in the south of the United of the, of um, you have North America, in the south of America, somewhere near Brazil or so, Suriname. Even if I was selling gala, I cannot reach Suriname. Huh? They are watching us from an island I may never visit till I die. Till I die. Sometimes I will get calls and the person is crying throughout. I say, why, why did you call me? Say, you will not understand. You will not understand. And then my heart is encouraged. I'm not competing with anybody. I know why I was born. And I'm ready to die for that reason. I'm not afraid. The reason you are compete, comparing yourself with people and allowing the, the success of people to bring you pain and depression is that you have not found your blueprint. The day you find it, you will find comfort. You will find contentment. Contentment. So why sit we here till we die? Because of their willingness to reject their current state, they entered into a new experience. Imagine the same people that were ostracized were the people that brought joy and celebration to Israel. It's not a matter of what you are looking like now. 
is a function of whether you are able to step into the things that have been promised. There are so many beautiful things written about you. Are you desperate for it? You know what I want you to do? Tonight, when you get home, every prophecy any man has told you, write it down. Write it, write it in a book and come with it this remaining six days that we are going to be praying. Come with it every day. And when we are praying, look at that prophecy and be asking yourself, why sit I here until I die? One of my sons came to see me in the office today. He's doing ministry somewhere in Udu. Doing ministry in Udu. Good man of God. And then when he was about to go, he said, pray for me. He said, every prayer you pray, the words that you say, I do not take it for granted. He now reminded me what I prayed the last time I was at his crusade, word for word. That's how you know somebody that is serious about destiny. As I'm here, every prayer my father and the Lord has prayed for me is in this my head, word for word. I went to see him in Auchi. As he finished preaching, he was entering the car. It was me and Ogogo. You remember now? He just held my hand and began to prophesy. I remember it word for word. I don't need to tell you. There are times that when I'm praying, I'll say, see what you said through the lips of my father. Why have I not become it? Which day I sent him a message. I said, daddy, see what you told me. When I brought out the WhatsApp message, he was shocked. Deeply, I, I have kept it. And the ones that have already begun to come to pass, have already begun to tick them. If you have a prophecy, the prophecy is not impotent. Your desperation is weak. You are satisfied with a reality that does not mirror the prophecy. When you become desperate, even the realm of the spirit we know. The realm of the spirit we know that, it, ah, this girl is now serious. It's at that time the Lord will now begin to deploy resources to bring to pass the things that have been spoken. So if there's a promise you have that has not been fulfilled, write it. These remaining five days, we may not be able to call out everybody's promise, but as we are praying, you now begin to factor it into your prayers. After these 40 days, I must become the things that have been prophesied. I must look like the promises that have been given to me. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Why sit we here until we die? Bow your heads. Just pray. One, one more prayer. One more prayer. Just ask the Lord for the strength to press into the things that have been spoken concerning you. Ask the Lord. On my altar is calling you. My altar is calling you <laughs> my altar is calling you my altar is calling you my altar is calling you. Tell the Lord as I sleep tonight, give me eyes that see. Don't let my night be wasted. 
Take me on a journey tonight. Tonight. If you need to show me a vision. If you need to give me a dream. Let it be clear. I'm tired of the confusion. Tired of the guesswork. I am tired. I want to be precise. I want to be accurate. I want to be aligned. When people ask me on the road, why are you like this? I will say, the Lord told me. The Lord showed me. I refuse to stay like this and die like this. So my altar is calling you up. If there is one person you will speak to after tonight's prayer, it has to be me. My altar has a voice. My altar is crying. Why sit I here until I die? Why? Why? Thank you, sir. In Jesus' name. Be it unto us even as we have prayed in the name of Jesus. I don't know why I kept hearing this in my spirit so it means that I'm hearing somebody's thoughts it happens to me the person was saying but me I don't have a prophecy there is no one that has really ever prophesied to me concerning this so what do I write down fear not beloved who is the person who is the person uh, so that I do these kind of things uh -huh. were you thinking those thoughts were you thinking those thoughts? So I do this kind of thing so that you don't think that I'm trying to be emotional. It's not that I'm trying to show you I'm anointed. So you don't feel that he doesn't have what to say. So he's, he's looking for how to say something. No. So what you do is, in these days that we are praying, are you still around till weekend? You're traveling this weekend, but you, you'll be joining online. You'll come back before the end of the week. Okay. But you are around. So as you are coming, come with a notepad. Huh? So while we are praying, God will be speaking to you. It might be the person leading prayer. He will just say something and God will say, that is for you. You write it down. It begins to form part of the things that will shape your pilgrimage in the future. Are you with me? Rise on your feet.